What the hell is all that nonsense all about? So it's the 25th birthday of the buy to let mortgage. This is of course something to celebrate, but those nasty lefties are saying something completely different. They're saying that buy to let landlords are no better than slave plantation owners. Well, let's bust these lefties, uh, set the record straight and explain how buy to let has transformed the UK economy for the good and look at the future for buy to let and buy to let mortgages. Hi, I'm Rajan Bhattacharya. It's the 25th uh, birthday of the buy to let mortgage. Of course, this is something to celebrate, but looking around at some of the newspapers, you would think uh, it's something completely different. Now, the newspaper I'm looking at is not um, the, the Morning Star or Communism Weekly or something like that. It is the Times newspaper, no less. And Libby Purvis says on the 25th anniversary of buy to let, um, she says, you're simply getting more vulnerable people to pay your mortgage and build your assets. It's not quite um, 18th century plantation owning, but the spirit is not dissimilar. What the hell is all that nonsense all about? If anything, buy to let has been a phenomenal enabler, both for landlord and renters. pre buy to let there was very little labour market flexibility. If you had a fantastic job offer in the other part of the country, then you had to pretty much up sticks and move and buy a house. Because the private sector rental market, apart from social housing, didn't really exist to that larger degree. And for people on the other side of the fence, the landlords who invested in buy to let property, well, this offered people who, who knew how to connect all the dots together the chance to really transform their careers and lives through their own efforts. Now let's look at life before the buy to let mortgage. Now, I once read a book uh, in my youth uh, written by a famous economist who's so famous I just can't recall his name. But he basically said this, that there are only a certain ways that people derive their income. There are some people that derive their income from ownership of assets. And typically, in times gone by, they tend to be the aristocracy. There, there's another group of people who um, derive their income from their skills, what they know, their knowledge. And those, in, 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 those have typically been uh, the middle classes, if you like, the, the professional classes, the doctors, the engineers, the accountants, the lawyers. And they're people who make their income from their labor, the uh, manual work, which is you know, typically being uh, thought of as the working classes. And for centuries, it has been next to impossible um, to move, to transition uh, between those classes. Now, of course, it's been possible for people um, to get educated and move from working class to middle class by picking up a profession. But to go from a profession or a working class background to make your income from ownership of assets has been exceptionally difficult. You had to be born into it in order to basically have land and property that, uh, that, that produced an income for you. What the buy to let mortgage did for the very first time, it meant that anyone, anyone could join the dots together to make their income from the ownership of assets because you could get lending on an investment property which was not dependent on uh, you and your background and your income and your assets and your wealth, but it was purely dependent on the income generating potential of the property. So all you had to do was figure out how to join the dots, find property that made cash flow over and above the mortgage service costs, then you could acquire that asset and basically uh, join the group of people who made their income from the ownership of assets. And that is a, a phenomenal democratization. It's democratization because it creates equality through equality of opportunity. So I don't understand where this is all coming from. So that's my rant out the way. We're going to explore um, what 25 years of buy to let have actually meant. 
We're also going to celebrate it a little bit, and we're also going to look at the future. Now, of course, um, being a relatively young chap, I wasn't around. Uh, I don't really, I was, I was too, too little to remember the dawn of buy to let. So that's why I have asked to join me someone who was uh, uh, well around at that time and remembers it very, very well. Andrew, hi there. Well, hello, Ranjan, again, and thank you for that phenomenally generous introduction from you. I mean, I'm just trying to work out why you wouldn't remember it. I mean, let me take you back and just jog your memory. I remember you munching on your mad cow disease beef burger. I remember you celebrating the great late Prime Minister John Major. And who couldn't forget when England hosted the Euros and Gareth Southgate missed that famous penalty. Surely you can remember that now. Now, there are some, uh, well, it's, it's, some memories are coming back to me now. <laughs> so that was the year the buy to let mortgage uh, uh, came in. I mean, what does it, um, what's, what do you think it's meant for the, um, for the UK, really? Well, for the UK, I think it's been a phenomenal, phenomenal enabler uh, and a phenomenal uh, way of enhancing our status on the global stage. If I went back to my default form of statistics here, back in 1996, there was 2.4 million uh, people renting private housing. That has now grown to 20%. This is according to NRLA statistics, which is 4.4 million. So there's been an additional 2 million homes created in this sector. Now, if we were to compare it to social housing, social housing is only 17% and providing for those most at need. So social housing's not providing for those people in the main marketplace. Now, what what has buy to let enabled us to do? I mean, we have a little bit of a, a, a sort of mobility issue where millennials in particular have moved around a lot more, but it also opened the doors back in 1996 to people who got a job in a different part of the country that could go and rent somewhere because more property started to become available. It allowed uh, the mobility of uh, people when the European Union allowed free migration across borders without limits. So it's, it's exploded in the UK and benefited the UK in a lot of different ways. You're absolutely what? right, because the, I mean, in 1985, of course, the AST, the Assured Shorthold Ten Tenancy, was brought in in major reforms to the um, private rented sector by Margaret Thatcher. But it, it was it was a, it was more than a decade between 1985 and 1996 when you could yeah. actually get a buy to let mortgage. Because although Margaret Thatcher freed up and liberalised um, the private rented sector, um, who would come into it if you can't if you had to have all cash? in order yeah. to buy a property. And during that period, it only tended to be uh, very wealthy people uh, and people in excellent jobs who could, who could go to their bank manager. Because remember, you actually had bank managers in those days. They could go to their bank manager and get a second mortgage for an investment property because they were a barrister or whatever. Um, but in 1996, um, the, the buy-to-let mortgage came in and it was much more about the income potential of the home, of the property, as opposed to the income generating potential or the assets or wealth of the purchaser. Absolutely. Well, I mean, the, there was an element of, of needing income uh, back in 1996 still of the purchaser, but it was predominantly around the assets. It, it wasn't till, shall we say, Freedom Day uh, in 2001 that that uh, opened up where it was not contingent on somebody's income. And I, I believe you have a, a little bit of a knowledge in that area, shall we say, back in 2001 when you were still in shorts? <laughs> no, yes, uh, what Andrew's alluding to, of course, is in 2001, 
that's the time I quit my corporate job because in 2001, the buy to let mortgage changed in that you didn't actually need a salaried income at all. Um, it was non-status. It was purely then judged on the property, um, property's income generating potential. We'll get back to the video in just a moment. What is the most exciting opportunity in property right now? And that is repurposing defunct commercial buildings to residential use. Now, most people don't really know where to start, what to look for and how to exploit these opportunities. And that's why I've prepared 90 minutes of free training for you to get you started on this wonderful journey. You can register for this free training at property-workshop.com. Join me on that free training and I'll leave you to enjoy the rest of the video. Now, of course, when we got into um, the 2000s, when we got into this century, I mean, I remember there were times in 2003, 2004, you turn on the TV at 8 p.m. in the evening and on primetime telly, on all five of the main channels, there was some property program about fixing property up, doing property up, uh, renovating property, uh, you know, homes under the hammer became a staple of daytime TV. Uh, and suddenly uh, the nation seemed to be addicted um, to doing property investment. And we had this remarkable thing which put the Brewer strategy on steroids, which allowed you to buy a property below market value. And if you bought a property for 80 grand, uh, but it was worth 100, then you could get the mortgage company to give you a loan based on the valuation, not on the price you were paying for it. Yeah, well, that was back in the heady days of same day refinance, when not only could you buy it below market value in the morning, remortgage in the afternoon to take 100% of your money out, but they were, in some instances, offering up to 125% of the valuation. So you could get your development finance out without having to go for a development finance loan as well if you wanted to enhance it or to use for a deposit for another property. They were crazy days, crazy days, but it all sort of came to a, a bit of a crash around 2008, didn't it? Um, I mean, in 2007, they stopped offering this product and then 2008, the housing crash. Now, Andrew and I are beginning to sound like those um, two crazy old coots from the Muppets uh, who sit in the... Uh the box at the top of the stage and have a bit have a have a have a moan or reminisce about the glory day. Wait, wake me when the show starts. It's already been on a while. Uh, wake me when it's over. But we're going to bring this back into the uh, the future uh, towards the end of this video because you know what? Um, when you talk to people who have been in property for a long time, um, they will always tell you. Um, about the glory days and the get the thing to remember is that uh, there's always a glory strategy um, the question is what is the glory strategy right now that if you adopt today in a few years time you will be sitting here like Andrew and I reminiscing about 2001 2002 and that's what we're going to crystal ball gaze towards the end of this video so stay tuned if you're enjoying this video don't go away without liking uh, share this video uh, with your uh, property investor friends and of course subscribe hit the bell icon and watch our content because we put out a lot of content on this channel all dedicated to keeping you on top of your property investment game. So all in all we say no to uh, Libby Purvis of the Times and buy to let mortgage is something worth celebrating. Andrew, we don't have to wear masks anymore. Didn't you get the memo? <laughs> I'm happy to party all day long on 21 year, 25 years of buy to let. So what's next for buy to let uh, and the buy to let mortgage and the like? I mean, of course, in 2015, we had George Osborne announce uh, what, what uh, has become Section 24 and tax on mortgage interest. And that's moved a lot of people into... Uh, owning properties and companies and the like. But let's just have a little chat about some of that. And we're not going to talk about the tax here. We've got plenty of videos on that and we'll leave some links uh, up here and in the description below. Um, but of course, Andrew, we're now seeing a change, aren't we, that more people are, and than ever before are taking buy-to-let mortgages and limited companies, not as individuals. 
Yeah, when George Osborne implemented his Section 24 tax reforms, uh, like this article, a lot of people said it's going to kill off buy to lets. Well, guess what? Five years on, buy to lets are still here. They're here to stay. Where there's change, there's opportunity. Now, for those in the know, as you say, there's some videos above all about how to restructure your property business into a limited company. But if we look at this from a government perspective, buy to let is really, really good for the economy. Number one, it allows mobility of individuals. The individuals pay tax. If they couldn't move to a place where the jobs were, they would not be able to pay tax. Number two, when a landlord buys a property, they pay an additional 3% in stamp duty to the government. Number three, if a landlord sells their property, they make additional tax to the government, which is capital gains tax. A homeowner pays nothing. And number four is, if they're doing this as a sole trader or a partnership, they pay income tax, or if they're doing it in a limited company, they're paying corporation tax to the government. So always round, the government wins. The government does not want to kill off buy to let. It is a cornerstone of the economy, providing for people who the social housing sector wouldn't provide for and enabling the economy to grow and create jobs in places where they're needed. Of course, the, the social housing sector is a safety net. It's a society safety net. Um, but not all people that want to rent um, qualify for those safety net provisions. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they, they are, uh, it's a choice as opposed to a, um, yeah. a bailout or a safety net type of provision. Um, so we're seeing that more and more, the, um, you know, the, the switch now to people basically taking out limited company mortgages. That used to be a tough thing in the past, but I see that switching completely in that about 20% of buy-to-let mortgages used to be limited company mortgages, 80% used to be individual. I see over the next few years that's going to switch. 80% uh, will be limited company. Um, but um, I think one of the things, um, and I don't know what your views are on this, one of the things that um, buy-to-let lenders are increasingly getting concerned about is not just, because um, before they were just looking at rental coverage pretty much and rentability, but now yeah. they're looking at how compliant the property is. Uh, because obviously if you can't, if it's not compliant, then you can't rent it. Absolutely. I mean, the, the mortgage lenders are becoming more and more attuned to what the market's legislation is. And there is a reason for that. In the future, there might be speed bumps in the economy. And if a lender has to step in and take control of a property, they need to know that the property is correctly registered with, say, a HMO licensing authority, and it's got all the relevant licenses. It's got the relevant EICR, Electrical Installation Condition Report. It's got gas safeties. It's got all of the relevant information about the EPC. And with the changes in EPCs moving towards the sea by 2025, the, land, the lender does not want to be left with a pig in a poke, but also they do not want the person who is buying the property to be left with a property that they can't improve an EPC to see, and therefore they can't rent any longer. So it is becoming more compliance driven, the lending, and it's likely to get more compliance driven as well. And then, of course, we've got these... Um... Um, these corporations coming in, haven't we? I mean, what I don't understand about these uh, these lefties like Libby Purvis, they seem very upset about private individuals owning properties or small companies owning profit, profit companies, but they're quite okay about, you know, Lloyd's TSB and John Lewis running in to uh, own thousands and thousands of properties. Um, what do you see? I mean, obviously that's a trend that's happening and we've talked about that in the past, but how, how do you think that's going to impact the smaller time landlord and investor. Well, I think it's going to change the landscape of landlording. You must uh, become 
incorporated and start to run a professional business in order to get finance, in order to be able to compete. The pension funds alone, uh, the last statistic I read, they were putting £5.6 billion pounds into private rental sector. Now, that's a huge amount of money. Work out how many houses you could buy for £5.6 billion. Now, what the corporatization is doing, if, if we look at John Lewis, Lloyd's, all the pension funds, they're creating large blocks of private rental sector for professional working individuals. Now, those um, blocks that they're creating are done for density, for ease of management, ease of repairs, and ease of marketing. Now, when we look at private landlords, the sector is going to change from where it is. And what you have to do is adapt and change in business. So if you're running a model that is going to compete head on with Lloyd's or John Lewis, you need to think who your customers are going to be and can you compete with them? Do you have the ability to be able to manage and maintain those properties if they're three, five miles apart? So your maintenance man has got long journeys between properties rather than walking from one flat to the next. So there's a big point there to, to consider how you evolve your business. I do agree with you. I think the, um, the, the big corporations, they're going to be going on standardization and having identikit type um, rental boxes, basically. Um, yeah. And, uh, and the smaller landlord will always be able to differentiate in the same way that you see the independent coffee shop next to the Starbucks uh, prospering because it's just not Starbucks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is the difference. It's run professionally and all the rest of it, but it's just not Starbucks. Uh, so yeah. that is a big factor. The other thing that, um, you know, because you've mentioned tax and all the rest of it, but the other things that I'm, I'm not really sure, and I don't understand why the new, some journalists are so negative against individual um, landlords and property investors, you know, like you guys, like me, like you, um, but they don't seem to have the same venom for the corporations. Uh, the headlines that I've seen whenever a corporation is looking to come into buy to let has been quite positive. But here's the reality, folks. Um, I'm going to finish shooting this video and I'm going to go out to have some lunch. And I'll be spending taxed money in the UK on lunch in a UK restaurant um, putting money back into the UK economy. These corporations that are going to be setting up, they're all going to be owned by BVI holding companies and they will have massive economies of scale to have corporate, corporate structures that all that profit is sucked out of the UK. Not that dissimilar to how utility companies are, the EDFs and the like, you know, they're all owned by foreign holding companies with the profits sucked out of the UK and not spent back in the UK economy. So what's better? Uh, you can leave your comments in the, uh, in the description below on what you think about that. Like this video and all of that as well. Yeah, Andrew. Obviously, Livy Purvis loves her Starbucks or her Costa Coffee, but she doesn't like supporting the independent and having uniqueness she likes the bland so andrew as a buy to let investor what's the opportunity of the moment what do you think we'll be looking back on in five years time and saying people that did this in 2021 2022 um had a field day well for me uh the next five years at least is all about creating value in your property investing portfolio now how can we create value if we've got the threat of large corporates moving in, we need to either meet them in the middle or do something different. Well, what are the large corporates doing? John Lewis is taking surplus space in their buildings and converting it to flats. Well, hang on, there's large offices, there's retail shops out there with surplus space. We've just gone through a COVID lockdown We've had businesses starting to decide office workers can work from home. We've got employees um, now wanting to work from home. 
And then we've got retail where organizations like Amazon have dominated and home delivery pizza services. And that's brought about a, a demand for dark kitchens. So that is creating a surplus of space where businesses are vacating the high street, vacating offices. Now, the big opportunity for the next five years, I see personally, is that it's the repropositioning of those sites. Now, you can buy them and add significant value, creating capital uplift. You can then rent them and compete because you're creating multiple units on the same site. So you can compete compete with Lloyd's or the pension funds or John Lewis because your maintenance is now constrained to one location. Therefore, it gives you density and it gives you improved yields. It gives you improved capital growth. So personally, that is where I think the massive opportunity is coming up in the future. Well, funnily enough, I agree with you. I think a lot of... um... Uh, basically, in recent years, uh, in buy to let, it's been a yield compression issue. And it's been uh, the yield that has been compressed has been net yield because of increasing costs of regulatory compliance. So one of the ways people have um, uh, um, uh, risen to that challenge is to do the multi-occupation route by doing HMOs. The issue with HMOs is this, um, is that HMOs, to be competitive, to have a decent product, you have to put in a huge amount of upfront cost to refurbish your properties, giving every room on suite bathrooms and all of that. And that is a massive high capital investment. And then at the end of the day, what have you got? Um, you've got something that might be valued on a cash flow basis, but it doesn't hasn't affected the bricks and mortar value. So your exit route on sale is only to another investor who actually wants that. So... Um, As an alternative, the smart money is now thinking, well, okay, we want multi-units. HMOs is having a whole bunch of capital costs in order to create the HMOs in the first place, plus the ongoing regulatory compliance issues, licensing, inspection regime, and all of that. Why not take former commercial buildings, convert them under permitted development into multiple self-contained flats units under one rooftop, not have any HMO licensing, spending a similar sort of money in terms of doing a full HMO conversion, but having all the um, simplistic regulation regime of single buy to lets, plus having multiple exit routes of being able to sell on individual units to owner occupiers. And I'm not sure whether people have fully um, joined these dots yet, because there are still many people spending huge amounts of money on these major HMO conversions when there is a better way. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, I, I do interviews with investors like yourself and the people I interview, I ask them how much they've spent creating their HMOs. And I actually spend less creating a self-contained block of flats than they're spending on HMOs. Now, I'm giving people a better product uh, than the HMOs that are being created. And I I can't believe people are not looking at the numbers. And like you say, the uplifted value, generally speaking, we double or triple our money in what we do. Now, in a HMO, they're not doubling and tripling the money in the capital asset value. So who's the smart one here? So we've had 25 years of opportunity, but you know what? Every few years in that 25 year period, the opportunity has changed a little bit. It's morphed a little bit. And there's going to be 25 years of more further opportunity in property because we all need places to stay. And the opportunity of the day will change every few years or so. And it's up to you to make sure you uh, are forward looking to make sure that you have got your eye on the ball and you're focusing on the opportunity of the moment uh, that will reap dividends going forward rather than harping on to strategies that may have worked a few years ago, which ain't going to cut the mustard today. And that's what subscribing to this channel is all about, to keep you informed of that kind of thing. So subscribe, hit the bell icon, let us know what you think 
uh, and how buy to let has affected your life in the comments below. Andrew, anything to say to wrap up? Well, personally, I think it's been a great 25 years. I'm looking forward to the next 25 where we can both be sat uh, in our care home together, looking out uh, on, on the future of our investments. <laughs> well, yeah, that's when that, that's when we're sort of uh, dribbling our food for a straw or whatever. And uh, Andrew, um, I think the mask suits you, so you might want to put that back on. Well, thank you very much. I, I shall do that and improve my good looks for you. He looks like a superhero now. <laughs> <laughs> All you need is a cape. Uh, uh, Captain <laughs> Bytelet. With that, we'll join you guys in the next video. Bye for now.